Welcome everyone to the Global Innovation Readiness Webinar Series, uh, Innovating for a Better World, uh, with today's topic on the SDGs and the impact for global innovation. We have speakers Viktor Sundman uh, from the Stockholm International Water Institute and Mahan Amanat, our Global OD and Transformation Leader at Global Minds Network. And I'll be your host, I'm the Founder and Executive Director at Global Minds Network, I'm Karina Jensen. Started when we launch our readiness journey, I uh, just want to make sure that everybody's on board. Uh, everybody's familiar with uh, Zoom webinars by now, but just make sure you've got your webinar tool there. You've got the Q&A for questions during the webinar uh, and chat, of course, if you have thoughts, comments, ideas. Uh, and uh, we will have, uh, we'll have um, uh, two speakers. Uh, so I'll, uh, Victor uh, will uh, speak from Siwi and uh, to or Stockholm Water International Water Institute uh, to share his story. And that will be followed by a talk from uh, Mahan Amarnat uh, to share his experience. And they'll be invited for a brief exchange or discussion around some questions uh, that I'll have for them. And then we'll conclude with a Q&A. So open it up for the audience and have uh, so to enjoy more exchanges. Uh, during the presentations, you will be muted. Uh, and then for the Q&A, uh, we'll take questions from the Q&A box or you can unmute yourself if you want to voice your question. Uh, just uh, to make sure everybody's on board, uh, could you say hello? Tell us where you're located on the world map. Uh, see where you're calling in from. So we'll make sure just a sound check to make sure you're all on there. Let's see, we've got, yes, okay. So we've got France, Canada, Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, Bengaluru, India. Great, France and uh, UK, Cyprus, California. Okay, uh, Rwanda, this is great. We're going around the world. Uh, Atlanta, USA, so um, wonderful. Welcome everybody, uh, hear me okay. We've got thumbs up, yes, all is good with sound. Quick yes, okay, great. Oh, we got Knoxville, Tennessee too. All right, let's get started with our world tour the um so we uh started this series last year uh, we launched the global innovation readiness series um, for the primary reason that we found that well in this changing world we need better ways to collaborate and innovate and so we thought a webinar series to explore these topics and look at how we move forward uh, would be a good idea. And by popular demand, we're bringing it back for this year, 2021, uh, with the theme Innovating for a Better World. And so we're here every last Thursday of the month, uh, so you can come and join us. Uh, we've already uh, had two topics on uh, innovation strategy, strategic co-creation. Today we'll enjoy a closer look at the sustainable development goals. And moving forward, uh, we'll be having webinars on inclusive leadership, uh, team collaboration, and global readiness. So please join us. Uh, we are, our uh, purpose, a bit about us, uh, why are we doing this? Uh, we're an international advisory who enables leaders and teams to collaborate and innovate for global and local impact. So we feel now more than ever, uh, we need to find ways uh, to solve big problems, and we can only do that through effective solutions for collaboration and innovation. Uh, so we're an international advisory network, a team of uh, international leaders, innovators, change makers who share a vision of facilitating multicultural collaboration to accelerate global innovation. So we have uh, seasoned or we have extensive experience. Uh, we have advisors and thought leaders who have a um, uh, lot of experience around uh, leading global initiatives and multicultural teams. And uh, we truly feel that we serve as your global mind trust uh, with expertise at the intersection of global innovation, leadership, multicultural collaboration, and digital transformation. And we embrace that through our global framework. 
to uh, for any global initiative, uh, we take you on that journey and ensure that you have the knowledge, uh, the expertise, and the advice necessary to move through every step from uh, co-creation to a uh, market and high performance. And uh, we make that happen through our three drivers, uh, collaborate through inclusive vision, dialogue, and space. So moving forward on today's topic, the SDGs and impact for global innovation. Uh, this is uh, one that is truly uh, dear uh, to us. We feel that it is so important now more than ever. Uh, and uh, we've seen that through this past year, a very turbulent uh, pandemic year. And moving forward, uh, there's been a lot of buzz and questions about what's the new normal? How do we, uh, you know, what's next? Uh, how are we going to uh, collaborate and innovate. And we feel that the SDGs should be at the top of that conversation. If we're going to make an impact and reach the 2030 goals, then we need to look at new solutions. And uh, we're uh, very excited about bringing this webinar topic to you so that we can take a closer look and see exactly how can we improve a collaboration and innovation for the SDGs. And so starting off that conversation, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Victor Sunma, Program Officer at Stockholm International Water Institute. And uh, Victor Sunman has uh, been working with um, CBS International Policy Team, has really been pioneering new initiatives, uh, launching new initiatives uh, to support the 2030 agenda. And uh, he'll be sharing his work around the Swedish Water House and uh, how uh, the um, cross-sectoral collaboration happens. Uh, he brings an impressive background, having worked for the United Nations of Sweden, or Association of Sweden, and also has um, a, a strong background in um, international peace and security. So I look forward to hearing from Victor away. Yes, thank you so much, Karina, for inviting me to speak here. And thank you for all of those who are turning to me in, whether it's early morning or a late evening. And it's great to have you with us. Um, I will start off by introducing uh, Stockholm International Water Institute a little bit for those of you who don't know us. Um, we are a water institute, uh, meaning that we work to strengthen water governance for a just, prosperous and sustainable future. Um, in a bit more plain terms, that means we're trying to improve decision making around who gets what water when. Um, and the way we do that is really, uh, is really through a few steps. We start with our knowledge generation. We have, I have very strong colleagues that have a strong research background, strong academic background. And we try to really be on the edge when it comes to water knowledge and how to best manage water. Uh, we then take that knowledge that we generate and apply that through different programs or projects to influence change and influence decision makers to make sure that this knowledge is just not something that sits in an ivory tower, but it's really used to improve, um, improve the way water is managed out there uh, on the ground in the world. And our vision is to work for a water-wise world where water really is uh, used in the best way possible and gets, um, gets to, to where it needs to and supports the needs and demands that we have on water. Uh, and we come at this from a range of different thematic angles. We have a transboundary water cooperation team um, that specializes in facilitating dialogue around shared water resources that's shared between national actors, between states. Uh, we have a water and sanitation team that works with state, uh, national, regional, and local governments to uh, make them understand the dynamics around the water system and the different needs and requests that comes in their communities for water. We have a water resource team that works with decision makers to ensure that we use our water resources in a sustainable way and that we don't threaten our ecosystem needs and that we're able to support those in the long term as well. Uh, Swedish Water House, which is the department of seaway that I work in, uh, mainly works in the Swedish context to promote dialogue on water within Swedish stakeholders, be that government agencies, academia, private sector, civil society. Um, and we, we really do this cross-sectorally. We have different cluster groups that we put together where we gather these different actors um, from a sector that is not usually thought of as water. For example, we've had a cluster group on forests, um, which 
but those actors did not before that really think about that much about how their sectors depend on water or how it affects water, but we brought them together, had them discussing using their knowledge to put together some joint uh, positions and finding some common ground, and then taking that step further and seeing, okay, how can the forestry sector, um, how, how, how can they adapt to better manage water and make use of the water resources and be a positive force on the water resources we, resources we have in Sweden. So that's one example, and we've done that across other sectors. I have colleagues working on with the pharmaceutical sectors, uh, colleagues working with the finance sectors. In the past, we've done it on food, also with faith-based faith -based organizations, so a wide range of actors there. What I'm mainly going to talk about today, though, is the team that I'm working on, which is the international policy team. And we work on global UN processes, um, mainly on climate and the 2030 agenda to promote water's role for reaching those goals and targets and make sure that, that water is understood, recognized and utilized in, in uh, support of reaching not least the SDGs. And when thinking of, of water and the SDGs, it's very easy to first go and look at, at um, uh, goal number six on clean water and sanitation uh, for all. Um, that goal is, is water's main home in the 23rd agenda. It's where we have a wastewater treatment. Uh, we have uh, freshwater ecosystems are in there, the need for water resource management in there. But if we take a wider look, we actually see that this is not the only place where water is in, but it's really something that flows through the whole agenda. And uh, uh, one way to, to show that is through this uh, alternative structure of the 2030 agenda, the SDG wedding cake, as we usually call it. Here we have placed water at the biophysical foundation that all the other SDGs are dependent on, together with those on climate and, and ecosystems. Um, and without, without this functioning biophysical um, biosphere base, we cannot really have any, um, any social or economic development, at least not in a sustainable and long-term way. And um, water also runs through these other layers of this wedding cake. Uh, when it comes to, to social development and society, we see that water is vital for uh, social development and human well-being. Whether we talk about, uh, when they talk about food security, human health, poverty eradication, water is there through irrigation, through hygiene, or just through making decent life possible. Uh, and it's also an important driver of economic development. So much of, of our economies depend on water, so much of our industry, our energy production, our, um, uh, our manufacturing, our transport, water really is everywhere here. And uh, it's a perfect example of the integrated nature of this agenda and how we really need to work in a holistic manner with all these goals and targets and that we cannot keep our uh, past silent approach that, that we've been so committed to in the past. A week ago, there was a high level meeting on water uh, arranged in the UN General Assembly uh, where these linkages between water and the all other SDGs were very well highlighted. And I think the line that was most repeated during that event was that water is life, water is sustainability, and that really underpins everything. And in that sense, water really is a blessing for, uh, for our society, but for the water community, this cross-cutting nature of water can also be seen as a curse. Because since water is everybody's business, it's nobody's business. Everyone, everyone care about, should care about water, but it's no one's main concern often. So in, or, in order to make sure that we use our water resources sustainably and efficiently, that we don't pol uh, pollute the resources we have, uh, that they meet the needs of humans, the economy, nature, and all those other things that we need it for, um, we cannot do it alone as the water community. 70% um, of global water use is used by the agricultural sector, 20% by the industrial sector, and really need to make sure that that use is efficient, and uh, that it doesn't pollute the, the resources we have. We need to work to promote waste, uh, wastewater treatment and reuse, make sure that water reach those most in need and those most, uh, most marginalized in society. And these are huge challenges, and they are not challenges that the water community can reach alone. Uh, it is dependent on extensive cross-sectoral collaboration. And this is something that the water community has struggled a lot with. Um, we in the community constantly talk about the need for reaching out and working with other sectors, but we very, very rarely do that successfully. It's very easy for us to get caught up in and talk about how everybody should care about water, because of course, water is life. Water is important for everyone and everyone is dependent on it. 
Um, and that is, that is true, but it does not get others to act. It doesn't inspire them to start caring about this. Um, they, they, it doesn't take precedence over the concerns that the other sectors are already having with their own goals and their own uh, ambitions. For example, the food and agriculture sector, they, they have their work cut out for them with providing nutritious food to feed people, which is another basis for human life, without also considering the water use and the water impact that they are having. The energy sector is struggling to shift the renewable energy to mitigate climate change. And they have enough challenges with that without the water community coming and telling them that the use of hydropower is bad for freshwater ecosystem and that they should find other solutions. Uh, setting and how do we foster cross-sectoral collaboration in that? Uh, and I believe it's key to rephrase the whole issue and stop talking about how the activities of a certain sector impact water and that they need to care because water is important for everything and that water is life. Uh, and instead start talking about how managing water wisely contributes to that specific, specific sector reaching its goals and solving its problems. Um, that way other sectors might be much more willing to listen because you actually focus on their needs rather than yours. You're no longer asking um, them to help you solve your problems, but, you, but you're, you're offering to work together to solve, to solve their problems or joint problems. And I will share an example of this a uh, very current example that's going on right now from the international climate policy space, uh, where our team has been quite active over the years. Um, within the UNFCCC, the UN framework for, for climate change, which sets up the structure of international climate policy, um, there is a platform called the Marrakesh Partnership. And uh, that's a platform for non-party stakeholders, meaning all non-state actors that are involved with this, uh, this international climate policy space. Uh, all the uh, businesses, organizations, civil society, you name it. Um, and all these organizations and actors uh, are divided into different thematic groups. Uh, there's one on transport, there's one on energy, one on land use, one on human settlements, and of course there's one on water as well, which we at CB is currently co-leading. And currently the main work within these different thematic groups, um, I, so the, the, the purpose of this partnership, the Marrakesh partnership, is to galvanize action and get commitments from non-state actors on climate action. And the, what we're currently working on is to develop uh, sectoral climate action pathways, plans for each of these thematic groups for how that specific sector can help reduce emissions and improve adaptation. Uh, and they're being developed by these non-state actors. So we are co-leading the development of the water action pathway. Um, and I can just show you the structure for, for that pathway. And uh, we have both um, plans within this. Uh, we, we have put down actions which are connected to reducing emissions from the water sector itself, meaning water supply and sanitation, water utilities, wastewater treatment and to protect freshwater ecosystems, often with both mitigation and adaptation benefits. But we have also chosen to include in this water action table, um, or water action pathway, uh, we include sections on energy and agriculture, despite, despite those sectors also having their own pathway, which they are in control of and develop, developing independently. Uh, for example, we have targets to increase investments in rain-fed agriculture, Splitting energy water use away from non-renewable to renewable sources of energy uh, and to promote solar heating, for example, to name a few. There are a lot of other areas within that. And this is a very conscious effort from our side to try to link with these other sectors, not least the energy one, to make sure that all of these pathways are synced, that we have coherent messages and that we work together to solve these joint challenges. Um, we're trying to use the opportunity here where we, within this Marrakesh partnership, have a joint goal of reducing emissions and adapting to the effects of climate change uh, and using that as a foundation to explore how we can work together to do that, how we can use, how we can plan together and set common targets that that transverse our, our sectoral divisions. And it has been a very fruitful collaboration. Um, the other thematic groups have been very open to exploring these linkages. I believe much more open to it than if it come out of nowhere, if we had just reached out and saying, Hey, you need to think about this when you when you are trying to uh, to reduce emissions in the agricultural sector. Um, and now that we have this joint platform, it has been much more natural, and we've been able to to talk from from a common platform. And we have been able to find some common ground and common recommendations, even on quite sensitive issues such as hydropower. And obviously, this is collaboration in target setting and quite high level planning. 
the next challenge really is translating this into more concrete policy making closer to the ground uh, ensuring that all relevant stakeholders are involved when decisions are made and that these concerns are lifted there as well and finally also of course in the implementation of projects and efforts to actually and to actually get this on the ground. And we're quite early on this journey, um, if I may say so, much earlier than I'd hoped we'd be, six years after adoption of the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement. And we have a long way to go. And, and this cross-sectoral collaboration, I believe, will be key and essential across uh, along that road to, uh, to reach goals we have set for ourselves. I should also mention that it is not only cross-sectoral collaboration that is important for this, but also multi-stakeholder collaboration involving many types of actor, actors, governments, both national and local, private sector, civil society, academia. Um, we will all have a role to play and, and have to do that in order to reach both the SDGs and the, the climate goals. Um, and of course, having both this cross-sectoral cross space and this multi-stakeholder space, um, it adds another layer of complexity. It blends further goals and objectives into the mix but it also adds additional ideas and viewpoints. And it is vital to have this whole side approach, to have the sufficient buy-in from all actors who do need to be involved if we are to reach the goals. And the title of, of this event today is on innovation. And I haven't mentioned that word until now, but that is really what this is about. And not in the sense of new technical solutions, but innovation in governance. Cross-sectoral work is new. We're not used to it. We're much more comfortable working in our silos. But that's just not going to cut it if we're going to accelerate action during the last nine years until 2030 and, and really get ahead. And especially now recovering from COVID, it's more important ever to, um, to get back from the, the losses we have made during this past year and to accelerate further. Uh, Multi-stakeholder is also new to that. We have been talking about for a long time, but not really doing it in a long way, especially not when it comes to involving the most marginalized. And we uh, work a lot with indigenous communities, especially to try to include their voices because they are very often forgotten in this process. And we need new forms of working together at all le levels and finding these innovative governance structures that and collaboration methods that, uh, that, that's really gonna, that really is what's gonna help us reach these goals. And it's at least as important as all the technical uh, solutions that we also need to, uh, to get further ahead on this and, and meet our sustainability challenges. I will uh, stop there and hand over back to Karina and thank you so much for this opportunity. You're on mute, Karina. Oh, there we go. Thank you again, uh, Victor, for a very insightful and uh, inspirational example. Uh, it's it's all about water. Water is our future. So we look forward to exploring this a bit more uh, in the discussion, upcoming discussion with you. Uh, next, we have our um, uh, speaker uh, and um, colleague, uh, Global OD Transformation Leader at Global Minds Network, Mahan Amanat who uh, brings extensive experience uh, from the NGO world. Uh, he has led initiatives not only on, from consultancies, uh, but also has led global initiatives trans for digital transformation and organizational change uh, from NGOs such as the United Nations uh, to SOS Children's Villages International. Uh, so we're going to draw from his extensive experience uh, to explore what are these common challenges that need to be addressed in order to uh, improve collaboration and innovation for the NGOs. So Mahan, I'll invite you to the, uh, the virtual stage. Here we go. Hello. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Karina. I'm, I'm quite excited uh, to be here uh, to share my uh, experience and thoughts with you on this very timely and highly um, significant topic on fostering a climate of uh, innovation and co collaboration, uh, both internally and, and externally uh, to the organizations where we work. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to attend. Um, my, my CV is on, on, on LinkedIn. Um, for the last 15 years, I focused on the not-for-profit organizations at the UN and the EU and the SOS. And I also worked on uh, blockchain at a couple of startups. 
what, I, what I have to say it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, my views on any of my previous employers. I'd like to keep it broad, quite simply because um, innovation within this framework of compliance and risk averseness in these NGOs and IGOs, the intergovernmental organizations like the UN and the, and the EUs, uh, is a pretty vast uh, topic, topic in itself and, and highly challenging. Um, I think that was a, uh, initi that was a recent um, publication uh, uh, collaboration between Accenture and the UN where the 50% uh, of the UN leaders basically said that they don't have the skills for um, uh, collaboration with the private sector. So, so there you go. I'll, I'll share that. Um, I'll share that uh, statistics later on. Now, uh, sustainability has been identified some ten years ago as the uh, greatest uh, driver of innovation, uh, and most likely will continue as long as the planet uh, remains uh, in this precarious state. Um, if that's the case, uh, then the overriding organizational culture of these intergovernmental organizations and NGOs surely must be innovation driven, um, top down uh, with everybody on the same page. Uh, and having worked for different kinds of NGOs and not, not, for, prop, uh, not for profits, uh, I don't really see that happening um, uh, again in, in my view. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to now focus on three or four aspects uh, as to why I think that's not happening, uh, and later uh, perhaps focus on the how uh, if we have time. I think that's important, uh, and what needs to happen internally within these intergovernmental uh, organizations and and the NGOs, especially the larger ones. Uh, so the four aspects I have in mind are the role of people and culture in these organizations. Um, the second is the organizational structure and missing structures and missing functions uh, in these entities. Uh, third is their reluctance to jump to jump onto the digital bandwagon. Uh, and fourth is uh, enhancing. How can we enhance uh, the donor uh, awareness? Um, so these are all systemic barriers and there are solutions. Um, and I think uh, innovation is important, but also I think uh, creativity is important. So if, if we are to create an organizational culture that foments, uh, that engenders innovation, uh, we'll have to look closely on the people side first. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that the key people-centric processes uh, continue to rely on a competency framework that uh, doesn't fit uh, modern needs, um, including and especially at leadership levels. Uh, the challenges in creating a modern and skilled uh, workforce uh, therefore increases uh, substantially. I'll give you an example. I, I, I often look through senior vacancies at many of these intergovernmental organizations and NGOs, uh, just to compare their competency framework to the one that uh, applied to my recruitment to the UN back in 2005. Uh, there is hardly any difference. Um, competencies that drive innovation, identify creativity, ethical risk-taking, ability to rebound from failure, or even good old passion, uh, don't seem to figure on these uh, competency frameworks. And that is a critical problem. Why? Because if the objectives that you and I need to achieve during the, during the performance year form the what, then the competencies provide the how, the skills, the, the attributes, the experience, the knowledge, uh, and so forth. Uh, essentially then, our what has changed um, significantly over these last 20 years, um, our problems are pressing, um, daunting, uh, and massive challenges, but the how uh, hasn't kept pace. So I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, innovation needs to happen within the organization itself first on the people side. The HR culture has to shift from simply developing the workforce, uh, which is the case in many of these international organizations, to one that asks what skills are needed to deliver organizational goals where HR takes on the accountability to, to change the culture of an organization, drive innovation, drive digitalization uh, as a HR, as a, as a transformation 
as a transformation partner. Uh, then there is also the uncertainty in developing, uh, engaging and enabling talent, uh, given that many of these intergovernmental organizations and certain NGOs tend to be career-based organizations. Uh, there is an absence of a performance-based meritocracy, which in fact uh, stymies uh, professional development and growth. Uh, recruitment, recruitment of talent isn't a problem because many of these organizations have a powerful uh, image, a powerful brand image, uh, but retaining them has been a, a, a significant, uh, massive challenge. Um, the how is, is not very, it's not rocket science. I think what we need to do is to take a critical look at the existing core competencies uh, in, our, in, our, in all our uh, organizations, all these organizations. And what needs to be said at this point is that many of the NGOs and the IGOs have a very significant uh, HQ component and a very significant field component. So we can't apply the same core um, frameworks for competencies blindly to both these massive components. Um, while it's normal or, or, or acceptable that 70% of your core competencies are similar to other organizations, um, uh, the 30% has to bring out the DNA of your organizations. Uh, somebody looking at your core competency should be able to say, look, these guys are most likely an NGO and they're most likely working in the humanitarian uh, field or in the social development, etc. cetera. So, so that's the first big uh, item that I'd like to uh, uh, raise. And the second is on missing structures. Uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a stark uh, figure. If you look at the uh, international governmental uh, the, the intergovernmental organizations, the IGOs, and some of the large NGOs, their um, success rate in, in uh, achieving their uh, targets um, hovers between 30 to 35 percent. And in the case of intergovernmental organizations who have access to unlimited money and talent, uh, the problem is actually uh, the, the fact that there are missing structures in addition to HR, IT, procurement, uh, and finance that are required to enhance uh, strategic plan rollout, to enhance the impact of uh, strategic plan rollout. So this is a problem of organizational design. It's a problem of organizational uh, development, uh, organizational structures, key, key structures such as um, management of risks, um, uh, data analytics, knowledge management, um, uh, global value chain integration. Uh, these structures are missing. In fact, if, even if you look at the business units, um, this kind of work hardly gets done. So we are looking at these large intergovernmental organizations who are actually running on IT, HR, finance, and, and procurement. These other key service functions are missing or they are tremendously under-resourced. So uh, how, do we, uh, uh, how, how do we bridge that gap? I think one of the first activities in my view that you may need to carry out is to undertake an innovation audit in your organization at, at various levels and, and carry out self-assessments to understand the underlying culture of innovation where you work. Um, something else that I uh, put in place uh, with some success are working groups or hackathons or, in, or innovation parenting. Um, we can talk more about this later um, if you like. Uh, and if any, any of you like to get in touch with me uh, individually, please do. Um, the third item that I should um, raise here um, or share with you uh, is the uh, digital strategy of many of these organizations. Uh, most IGOs and NGOs have yet to develop uh, di uh, a digital strategy to uh, complement or underpin their strategic plan. In fact, uh, um, they would benefit from co-crafting or co-developing their plans with other main actors in the same SDG. Uh, in this manner, they could strengthen each other's uh, strategic plans and digital strategy in the process. And, and together they have a 
greater chance of uh, impacting or influencing the, the global KPIs and the global outcomes. Uh, then there's the slow uptake of modern technologies such as AI, blockchain, and IoT in particular. Uh, both my experience with startups uh, with blockchain, uh, identifying use cases and el elaborating proof of concept, etc. Uh, I, I believe that we could use public um, blockchains to integrate program management across the 17 SDGs uh, to provide a decentralized and, and transparent means of linking global outcomes, uh, which would further ensure accountability um, in, the, in the process. Um, so these are these are risks that I, I believe that these organizations should take because innovation, um, it's not only about creativity, but it's also about taking the risks, um, failing, rebounding, and, and not giving up. And, and uh, these intergovernmental organizations have all the means uh, they require to take those risks. They have the financial uh, prowess uh, and they have the talent. I believe 80% of these organizations had the talent uh, that they require to, to embark on, on, on uh, risky uh, ventures. Um, the, the, the last bit um, is, I think- Amar, I think your, your screenshot is showing instead of your face. Oh, what happened here? I think it might be slow network. Um, let me check. Uh, yeah, I see a I see a red light coming on. I think it's my router. Okay, I'll I'll. Well, uh, am I back online? Yeah, am I back online? Okay. Uh, the donors uh, of NGOs and intergovernmental organizations, um, uh, especially those who are working along the same SDGs, they need to get together to focus on their uh, respective NGOs' core value and service propositions. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's a great overlap in the services that they provide. If you, if you look at the um, child care and youth development sector, um, you have you know, four or five large NGOs there, SOS, Plan, World Vision, Save the Children, and then, and then uh, you've also got uh, UNICEF in there. So uh, by focusing on what they do best, uh, they should be able to deliver greater impact despite zero or, or negative growth in their budget lines. Uh, whereby beneficiaries have a choice of which NGO to turn to for which particular service. So we see that happening in other industries like in telecom or in the banking. And uh, there needs to be more collaboration between IGOs and NGOs with industry, academia, government, and even the military, because many military um, in various uh, countries, especially the developed countries uh, who work with large budgets, most of which actually goes towards innovation. And, and, and they have the discipline and they have the strategic objectives very much foremost in their minds. Um, now, uh, the, uh, uh, the thing is uh, that, that uh, I, I referred to the Accenture study at the, at the beginning and 78% and, uh, of UN leaders uh, cite uh, restrictive legal policies and procedures uh, that delay or limit partnership opportunities. So it's a bit of what uh, Victor was saying. He's working on the policy side. And while 50% uh, see a lack of partnership building skills across the UN system, now nearly half of the UN leaders, again, 47% also see a wide discomfort uh, with business motivations for profitability in partnerships as a critical barrier that the UN systems, they say, must overcome uh, in order to be a more attractive partner for the private sector. So um, four areas I've tried to touch upon strategy, people, process, and technology. And, and these four com components are not standalone, of course. Uh, one aspect that ties them all together is leadership. Uh, we can't continue to use existing leadership models because let's face it, um, it hasn't worked for the most part. Uh, the planet is in a mess, uh, except for you know, people like David Attenborough, who's been you know, trying to tell us that we are destroying the planet for the last 25 years and people like Bill, Bill Gates and a few others 
I think we have to move move on from uh, individual leadership uh, that's been profit centric to integrated leadership, one that benefits uh, society uh, primarily. Um, I've 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 rushed through a lot, uh, but I think what would be quite interesting is to have um, some discussion and have have your thoughts. So I'll I'll hand it back to uh, Karina. Thank you. Thank you to Mahan Amanat uh, for a very insightful overview of what do we need to consider in terms of the challenges and, um, and potential solutions too. Uh, I, I would like to at this point invite both Victor uh, Sunman and Mahan Amarat to our virtual stage uh, just for a, a quick conversation before we open it up, uh, open up the questions to everyone. Uh, let's see, Mahan, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. So we have all three here and um, on the stage. So I'd like to um, address the theme of collaboration, bringing that back uh, or to the conversation because uh, Victor, you really emphasized in terms of advancing the water agenda, how important collaboration uh, will, will be uh, move, you know, uh, moving ahead. And um, Mahan, when you were describing how uh, NGOs and nonprofit organizations can better innovate, uh, my question, uh, I've thought, well, okay, where, how can collaboration facilitate that process? So my question for each of you is, where do you see, what are the collaboration drivers? What is important now, for Victor, in terms of advancing the water agenda, and maybe in Mahan, in terms of where you see that innovation framework, where is it most critical to ensure collaboration? So I'll, I'll um, we'll go to Victor first. Yeah, thank, thank you. That's a great question. And I, I think one of the main things, um, picking up a little bit on what Mohan was talking about, is that, that there really needs to be some shared culture, um, some mutual culture, even when you do the external collaboration with other cross-sectoral actors. Um, you, you need to so have some mutual understanding of, of what you're trying to achieve um, and, and the, the understanding of what the other party, what the value is for them and what it is for you. And Maha was talking a little bit about the, um, for example, with the resistance to profitability uh, within UN systems and, and that being a hindrance for working with the private sector and to facilitate that type of multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder um, collaboration, you really need to like get on good terms with that and start speaking the same language and, and being, uh, and, and finding a joint common ground for that. And that goes for the cross-sectoral as well. Even if the water sector and the energy sector we're not going to have the exact same goals with the the uh, collaboration, but we can find enough common ground and common goals and work together to achieve those. That can be um, that that can be good enough. Uh, so, so I do think that finding that mutuality and that common ground is an important part of it of facilitating it. And we'll go to Mahan. Where do you um, see the collaboration drives being most important in? in a, you know, developing innovation or more innovative culture? Um, I, I think for me, there are three. One is leadership, obviously. Uh, and uh, second, I think, uh, is the organizational culture. Uh, and third uh, is accountability. Uh, we haven't spoken much about accountability. Um, all these days, we spoke about responsibility, but I think we need to uh, elevate it to, to, be, to everybody being accountable for the planet. And, and I think we need to extend the value chains. We need to extend the value chains into our high schools. We need to help. I mean, we are SOS where I worked uh, before. Uh, they are in the child and youth development. And there the, the value chains have to be extended into the schools to create an awareness of uh, being accountable for the planet for tomorrow in the, in the next generation of... Um, so I, I, for me, the organizational culture uh, on, the, on the internal uh, aspect of an organization is extremely important insofar as introducing new skills. Um, in fact, that, that, same, that same study says that there's a massive capabilities gap. Uh, partnership building requires certain types of skills which are in short supply in intergovernmental organizations and in NGOs. 
uh, and there are other resource barriers to do more uh, with less. So um, not in any particular order, leadership of, of culture and accountability um, um, and governance frameworks. And if we bring it back to leadership, is this an area that you emphasized? And so what kind of leadership does it take? Because this is something, uh, you know, a very important aspect that we are looking at developing at Global Minds Network as well as inclusive leadership. So what exactly does that mean for um, non-governmental organization? Do you see a new generation of leader? Or what do you see in terms of the new leadership competencies? Um, that's a, it's a tough question. Um, if I can answer that, I'll probably win the Nobel Prize and all the boat, all the all the boat prizes and and and, and sporting prizes so we, uh, in in the in the market. But, um, I think um, I look at um, leadership from different um, industries that are purely talent driven, like like football and, and music and haute, haute cuisine. And in those industries, uh, leadership is all about the transfer of emotions. Uh, when a chef puts out a, a wonderful um, uh, a product, uh, a meal on the table for his clients in the evening, it's, it's, he's, he's transferring his emotions into that product. Um, and and you, you have this in industry with people like uh, Elon Musk and, and, and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Uh, if you look at football, um, the, uh, the emotions of Jurgen Klopp and his team at Liverpool is, is, trans, is what you see when you, uh, you find uh, Liverpool playing on the pitch. Um, likewise, you have someone like Jose Mourinho, who's a very wily very you know crafty manager and his teams are extremely difficult to break down so there's a transfer of emotions same thing in in music and i think what i'm trying to say is that these products and services that the ngos put out it needs to have that it needs to embody the dna of the of our leaders uh, they need to somehow make it into their personal mission. It's, it's, like, it's like you have a hobby that becomes a job. Uh, and that's the case we see with you know, Bill Gates. And that's the case we saw with Elon Musk and, and Richard Branson. And, and, uh, and when you think about similar leaders in IGO, in intergovernmental organizations and similar leaders in NGOs, I, I'm sorry, but I don't see anybody. So I think, uh, I think leadership has to follow the model of uh, startups uh, in, in the NGOs and intergovernmental organizations. Okay, interesting. And, and so I'll, I'll bring it over to you, Victor, because you represent the new generation of leadership. And, and I'd like to hear from you, what do you see as the, the new qualities and, and that are important for uh, reaching the NGO goals? Or the, I'm sorry, SDGs. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a very, that's a very interesting, interesting perspective from uh, from Mahan as well. Um, I, I I do like this transferring of emotions. Um, in, of course, in order to get that to translate into an external product and and to get that results, you need you need the ability to to carry the organization with you. And in the case of a startup, that might be easier because you're breaking new ground and you can kind of form the the um, uh, the organization from scratch. With existing NGOs, many of which can be quite large and already have established organizational structure, structures and, and, and organizational culture, that might be more difficult. And I think I think a key part there is this, as you mentioned, inclusive governance or uh, inclusive leadership earlier, Karina, and making sure that voices are heard, making sure that that even more junior um, junior colleagues are heard. I think that is one important part of it, and also getting and generating these new ideas from people that haven't been in the sector for a long time. Yes, they might lack an experience and not, not uh, be as familiar with, with how everything usually works. And that is in some cases, that's a drawback. In some cases, that's a benefit. That's what you want. You want something to look, you want someone to with fresh eyes to look at something. And uh, and especially when it comes to uh, revisiting structures and, and, and ways of working that don't work, that pair of fresh eyes can be extremely vital. So. Uh, so inclusion, I think, is one of the key, key words there. Great. 
Well, thank you to both. I'm, I'm going to wrap up our discussion because we have a, a, quite a few questions from the audience. So we want to make sure we have time for them too. Mohan, are you still with us? Yes. Okay. Uh, to make sure we don't see you on video anymore. I'm here uh, both physically and spiritually. Oh, good. Okay. And, and <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Jeremy Solomons. Uh, please say more about the competencies needed for HQ and field staff at NGOs. Any uh, yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you an example. Um, in if if you take HR, uh, in the at HQ, HR is all about um, creating policies, um, ensuring policies are implemented uh, through a mechanism that we call delegation of authority from HQ to the field. And if there are policies that are lacking or, or, or missing, or if there are solutions uh, that are half-baked uh, uh, or, or in fact missing, in, 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 uh, I, I can cite some examples, uh, then the field operations uh, suffers a lot uh, because in the field, you, have, you need a different kind of uh, competency framework. You have to be very responsive. HR is often the face of the organization in the field. Uh, sometimes uh, when there are no solutions at HQ, you have to basically become creative and invent solutions. Uh, and when you have certain cases of say child abuse, um, where HR uh, or, or some form of harassment where HR gets involved right from the word go, uh, very often uh, we find that uh, the, the processes at HQ level are, are not complete. They are incomplete in terms of identification, escalation, and resolution of breaches. There are all kinds of gaps and there, are, and there aren't any bodies like the ethics bodies or the ombudsman's bodies or the administration of justice bodies. So we have to, in the field, come up with solutions very, very fast. Within, within five days, for example, we need to protect the victim, we need to protect the whistleblower, and we need to get to the bottom of the story as quickly as possible, because after five days, the victim or the whistleblower most likely will change uh, their stories because they have been threatened and their families have been threatened. So the skill sets are very, very different in the field uh, from HQ. And, and, and I'm, I'm speaking of HR broadly, but I'm also speaking of people skills. These are, I don't think it's fair for me to call it as HR skills. These are actually people skills. Um, so the people skills in, 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 um, uh, uh, at the field level are significantly different from what's required at HQ. I don't know if I answered. Is that Jeremy? It's Jer for I Jeremy yeah. Solomons, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question from Margu Bara. Uh, let's see, in terms of she thinks uh, both of you, and uh, would like to know uh, about leaders from emerging countries. So looking at building a political system based on the use of blockchain, or what kind of leadership will it take in the future, you know, moving ahead and how uh, technology figures into leadership as well. Is Any, that uh, for me? Victor or Mahan, Vic either one? Yeah, what, uh, Victor. What, yeah. Um, oh, Victor, well, please uh, yeah, no, uh, technology is not my area, I can, I can say uh, <laughs> straight off, and don't ask me to explain the blockchain, blockchain or anything like that. What I can say is, is when it comes to communication um, and leaders, we, we have a entirely different information um, environment that we had a few years ago in a communication environment. And uh, as we have seen since 2016, not the least, the, there is an unprecedented opportunity for leaders to speak directly with, uh, with peoples. And that brings both enormous potential. And uh, we've seen it utilized by, by diplomats, for example, in, in communicating uh, with people in the country that, that they are, um, where, where they are based and representing. Uh, and, and to share the information and to really be able to, to be in, in, in touch with the communities that they are there to, to work with. But there's also the drawback of, of um, the, with, with much more information being online, there's also the potential of that being misused and monitored in that, and, and used for oppression. So yeah, te technology will change and have already changed with leadership and it's not least communication from leadership um, and, and, and allowing 
a little bit more a two way direct two way communication between leaders and and communities, I think. But I don't have a more in depth answer of, of how to utilize that to the best way. Well, um, if I might add one or two sentences there. Um, diversity is, is certainly a driver of innovation. Um, and I think uh, here in Europe, we, we feel it uh, because um, globalization um, in many countries um, uh, has, been, uh, has been an opportunity for them. Uh, but there are countries where globalization is actually a threat. Uh, and and uh, you, and you can see that uh, in in France especially uh, where diversity in organizations um, it's it's commonplace uh, if you look at uh, middle management and below but at the leadership positions um, it's not very common um, and if I if I look back at my experience with blockchain um, one of the projects I worked for. Uh, uh, was about um, using blockchain for reference checks and uh, employment checks. Um, and it works uh, beautifully. And we were trying to partner with NGOs and the UNs uh, and we, were, um, we wanted to test our product and we wanted to give our product uh, free of charge in fact. Uh, but we found no takers. Uh, we found no takers at all, uh, not even from the NGOs. So I think there's a, there's a lot of um, fright, I, I understand, about profitability um, and society, societal needs uh, getting mixed up in the same uh, bucket. On the other hand, I think there's also a lot of uh, mistrust in technology, uh, in, especially in new technology. And, um, and I think that's one area where the UNs should be partnering more uh, with the private sector, especially with the innovating companies and especially with, uh, with startups. Great. Uh, we may have time for one quick question. Uh, Chidananda, did you have a question? I thought you, uh, you raised your hand. Do you want to send a quick, uh, I don't. No, no question, or do you want to type it in? Okay, no, all right, I just thought it. Well, uh, we need to wrap it up. We're almost at the end, but I thought I'd have a wrap up question because, so how do we move forward? What could be one step or what do you think is important this year that um, uh, where we need to place our focus uh, to uh, accelerate collaboration and innovation for the SDGs? or one tiny step that all of us can do <laughs> to move forward and support these efforts. Yeah, no, if, if, if I go first, maybe three, three things that are more on the vague high level part is be ambitious. Uh, we need ambitious action. We need, we need to think big uh, going forward. So that's one step, be bold. Uh, Mahan talked earlier about daring to, to make mistakes and bounce back for them and that is something that's real crucial because we're not going to do the flawless nine years going forward but we need to be bold and, and, and dare to try anyway and be creative and uh, step out of the comfort zone and, and explore new things is, is definitely the way to get there and, and step out of old systems try and try new structures uh, try new innovations whether they be technical govern, uh, governance or blockchain innovations and um, dare to do that and in in the uh, in the personal life that everyone can do regardless of their profession or where they're active I just say be reflective and, and think about your own actions and how you live your own life and see what impacts um, do you have there and what are the easiest changes because in the in the end we need we need a big action but we also need the small actions and th those small actions when they come from all individuals they add up to big change so so that's something that that really everyone uh, can do in their own lives great last word Mahan Um, no, I agree completely. Push the push the envelope. Uh, you can push it uh, yourself at home, uh, your friends. You can also push the envelope at work. Um, it's a, it's a vast topic, and I I'm, I'm looking at the question from Jeremy Solomon, and he says these are all old white men. <laughs> Yeah, well, we want to stay positive. We, we're you know moving forward and. Um, 
Uh, I want to thank you so much, Mahan and Victor, for wonderful insights and inspirations uh, for um, you know, our topic today on the SDGs and how to make an impact for global innovation. A uh, thank you to all of our attendees and your questions. Uh, and uh, would like to remind you that uh, for our next uh, webinar, our next step on our readiness journey is Thursday, April 29th. Uh, we'll have our global leadership and innovation leader, John Metzeler, with guest speaker, who will share insights on inclusive leadership for multicultural innovation. So a nice transition from our topic and moving forward is taking a closer look at leadership. Uh, for info registration, you have our link there for the webinar series. Uh, stay updated and follow us via our uh, LinkedIn company page. And uh, for any additional questions or more info, please feel free to contact me at the email there or visit our website. So thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Take good care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Karina. Thank you.